Brothers and sisters, the Lord is with you. And also with you. We continue listening to God speak to us from the gospel in the tradition of Luke. Glory Glory to you, Lord. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town he he intended to visit. He said to them, the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers for the harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be with this house. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest but if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you, for the laborer deserves his payment. Do not move from one house to another. Whatever town you enter, they welcome you. Eat what is said before you. Cure the sick and say to them, the reign of God is at hand. And this is the gospel, the good news of our salvation. By the words of the gospel, may our sins be blotted out. Amen. Each one of us wondered, what the heck is these people that back and forth is switching off? We do this all the time. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Last week there was hardly anybody here. It's so good to see people found out where we were still here. Um, as, a, as a preacher, you begin looking at the scriptures uh, a couple of days ahead of time, and you're trying to figure out, you know, what would be the best one, because we have three different, uh, you yeah, the first reading, the second reading, and the gospel to preach on, or you can preach on the opening prayer, or you can preach on the, uh, uh, the psalm that we use, um, or on a, a, a topic that may fit all these things together. And sometimes the Holy Spirit has a way of being so fickle she is. And you think you have it down until you hear the words spoken to you and you go, oh, okay, that's not exactly what I was going to preach on, but it works. And that's what happened to me tonight. I was listening to these words that I had read before. I read them, in fact, just this afternoon. And I was going to preach on the 72 going out and missionary uh, uh, missionizing and how our call as Christians is to go out and to missionize. And all of a sudden, I heard that first reading from Isaiah, rejoice with Jerusalem. Can I say rejoice? And the word Jerusalem kept on coming up, coming up, coming up. And I'm thinking, but why? It's a city, an old city. But it's a city, Jerusalem. And then it began, as I'm listening to this reading, my mind is, is flipping through the prophets and the Old Testament and how many times that city it comes up in the scriptures. And so obviously it's a very important city within the structure of the Jewish community. Then I began to think, okay, fine, but what does that have to do with us today? Well, let's see where the Holy Spirit leads us this afternoon. The word Jerusalem means city of peace. And it was a Canaanite city that was established way before the Jews took over that country, which we call the Holy Land. And it was a very interesting city because it was built on a a, a mountain top, a hilltop, and, and the, the structure was so built that it was a fortified city. In other words, that the enemy had to climb a hill to get them. Then you then you faced uh, sheer walls, and so you had the army having to come up a hill to face sheer walls to get into the city, and so it was a fortified city. It was a very difficult city to conquer. But Jerusalem had another benefit, and that is it had what they call an internal water source. 
In the old days when they, an enemy could not conquer a city, what they would do is just encamp around the city until they ran out of food. The people would starve to death and they would walk in and take over. But <clears throat> Jerusalem had what was an internal water system. They didn't have to go out to get water for the city. There was a well that was dug in the middle of the city that went down to the River Jordan. And it was this offspring of the River Jordan, which is just not that far from the old city. And they were able to have water. And there they were able to store food for as long as necessary. And so it was a very, very difficult city to conquer because of the where it was built on the hill, the sheer walls of the city having protecting it and also having an internal water source. It wasn't until the Jews came along and David finally was able to figure out where this water source was and sent his armies through the water source up into the city. And there he was able to conquer that city. And that's why it's called David's city, because he conquered it. It's his. And so we have this city, Jerusalem, now becoming the capital of where David is as king. And we, we, we're not even going to go into Saul and, and all that which transpired prior to this time. So we have this city, Jerusalem, now belonging to David. And David's idea is now to build the temple. And Nathan, the prophet, goes to him and says, God says, who do you think you are that you're going to build me a house? That's not happening. And so we see that temple not being built until when? Solomon. And it is in Solomon who then is the one who builds the great temple that lasts until the Babylonian uh, come and, and destroy the city. So here you have a city, Jerusalem, the center of this country called Israel. And we have the temple there. And so with the temple comes the priesthood and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so it becomes a very, very important place for the Jews. But even more importantly, it becomes the, the, the place where God dwells. Remember, the Jews were forbidden to make any type of graven images, uh, statues, uh, pictures of God. That was forbidden. But they could say, that's where God dwells, and point to the temple. That's where God dwells. That's where our God dwells. We don't know what he looks like, but that's where he dwells. And so the temple now becomes the physical, concrete image that the Jews and people need when they're talking about a God, because we need something tangible that we can relate to when we talk about our God. And so we, we, we as Christians have Jesus Christ, but the Jews didn't have Jesus. They had a God who says no graven images. And so we see within the history of the Jewish people Jerusalem surfaces as a very, very important city because of this fact that it's there where God dwells. The Holy Temple is there. And, what, and the Solomonic Temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, and later on it is rebuilt by Cyrus, um, and uh, then again destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Enough for history. So... Why is, is this Jerusalem so important? Why do we sing about Jerusalem? We sing about Jerusalem because of the fact it is what we would consider heaven on earth. It is the tangible place of God's dwelling on earth, God's reign. If we talk about God's reign, as we heard, know that the, that the reign of God is here, but where? In Jerusalem. Because that is where the kingship of God was to take place once the Messiah came and conquered Israel's enemies. And we take that image into the New Testament. We take that image 
into uh, the, the writings of the prophets of the New Testament. And we see it over and over again written in Revelation, the new Jerusalem. And we have John then using this idea, this structure, this concept of Jerusalem, the ancient Jerusalem, <coughs> as the new Jerusalem, which is our heavenly home. And so the early Christians, as they're reading these words or hearing these words, they're already beginning to understand and to, and to, uh, to conceptualize a place, a place, a structure that is awaiting those who serve and love God and whom God loves. What does that do for us today? Well, I think it gives us a sense of grounding. Many times we as Christians, you know, we, we go through our lives, we don't have a lot of grounding in the sense of, um, Churches, our churches sometimes these in, in these days are, are not what they used to be. We go to church, this is our church building, but surely not our church home. This is surely not our church home. We remember when we were kids that the church was the center of activity. It is there that you went on Sunday to Mass. It is there where you went to school, if you went to public uh, uh, parochial school, but it was there you also went to learn your catechism on Monday afternoon if you went to public school. It is there that the Boy Scouts met and the Girl Scouts and the Brownies because we were not allowed to go with the Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> and so it became the, the focal point. The church became the focal point of our community. In neighborhoods, you didn't ask what, where, what street you lived on, as Father Joe knows you, what parish did you go to? And that identified you. If you went to St. Anthony, oh, that's the Italian parish. <laughs> if you went to St. Paul, oh, the German parish. A uh, Holy Trinity, that was the uh, Lithuanian parish. You know? So you identified yourself with that parish, with that particular structure, that church, that family. And unfortunately, what happens after World War II, we have the melting pot experience. Everybody says America was the melting pot. Everybody came to America. <coughs> but everybody came to America and settled in their own territory. The Poles went with the Poles. The Jews went with the Jews. The uh, Germans went with the Germans. The Italians went with the Germans. And so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. And it wasn't until after World War II when the GI benefit was given that we see the suburbs beginning to grow up and people beginning to meld into one another so that you had next living to one in the same neighborhood, a Polish family, a Jewish family, a, a, a German family, an Italian family, an Irish family. And so the melting pot began to take place. But also what happened is the parish church began to lose identity because it ceased being the center of activity for that particular group of people. And so that brings us here today to this building, which we call our church. And it is here that we worship. It is here that we have a cup of coffee and a cookie. It is here that we may come and have a social night once in a while. But the question is, is this our church is this our Jerusalem? Is this the place we identify with? Or is it just a convenient place for us to come to get that obligation on Sunday Mass out of the way? It's very difficult for leaders, whether religious or lay, to establish a home for people because it's the people who establish the home. The leaders of the parish only are here to present to you the structure, the outline, the model. But it's your responsibility to create a home. 
it's your responsibility as parishioners of St. Francis Sinclair to see this as a special place. A place that is not just for you to come to get your obligations done on a Sunday or a Saturday evening, but rather a place that you come to gather with brothers and sisters, your family, regardless of your ethnic background, regardless of your mother tongue, regardless of where you come from, the north, the south, the east, or the west, or Brooklyn, <laughs> and to create a home. And so maybe we need to put down on our call cards, this is the parish of St. Francis and Clare. This is the new Jerusalem.